Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense today. We will start a new playlist, Anesthesiology, baby. And there is no better way to start the series other than a brief history of anesthesiology. Let's get started. Why do we study history? Because it's important to know whence we came so that we may understand where we're going. Preach the word, Todd. I am so thankful for the great medical student, Dr. J. He supported my channel and he is the reason of the existence of this playlist called anesthesiology. And I can't forget Dr. Joe from Canada who supported my pulmonology playlist. And now we have Dr. J. And because a good doctor is a good observer both of their names start with a j and oh wait a second there is a pattern here canada then the u.s and then oh mexico so if your name is jorge from mexico you might consider chipping in some cash maybe we can start cardiology i'm just saying I'm joking. So what is anesthesiology? Basically, it's some physiology, pharmacology, and internal medicine mixed together in a blender. So if you are good at physiology, if you have a robust knowledge in pharmacology and you're good in terms, you will be, you will thrive through anesthesiology like a sharp knife through warm butter. We divide anesthesiology into general anesthesia and local anesthesia. What's the difference? General has one purpose, uh, like major surgery. So we want to basically knock you unconscious so that we can operate. All right. And if you want to operate, we better relax your muscles because let's say I'm operating in your abdomen. Once I touch a muscle, it will twitch, contract, and it will ruin the surgery. So I need to provide anesthesiology and muscle relaxation. On the other hand, local is completely different. Let's say I want to uh, work on your mouth like you have the freaking dentist or I want to remove an abscess. This is local, lidocaine, etc. There is also a subtype which is in between general and local and it's called regional. It is not as general as general and it's not as local as local. General anesthesia is all over your body. I want you unconscious. I want you to experience analgesia and muscle paralysis. Sensory loss, motor loss. You can't feel, you can't move. And more importantly, I want you to emerge and recover after the surgery and wake up again. Local, I am applying pain relief locally until I extract your tooth, remove your abscess, etc. Regional is something like epidural. Oh, for like the pelvis, perineum and lower extremities. This is regional. It's not your entire body. It's also not local. It is regional. Bigger than local, but smaller than general. So let's start with ancient Greece. They used ineffectual potents and poppy extracts. The Greek philosopher Dioscorides coined the term anesthesia, which means basically no sensation or no consciousness. It's a drug-induced, reversible state of unconsciousness and no pain sensation. Dioscorides coined the term because he observed the narcotic effects of the plant mandragora. This is such a wholesome name. Don't get me started on heterophis heterophis. So you can write anesthesia this way or this way, just like easier for simplicity. But please don't write it this way. Don't write it AE because this is not AE. This is one letter in Old English. Don't make the mistake that Davidson's internal medicine makes. Isn't that hilarious that the most important medical textbook in the UK cannot even write English? And I am sitting here as an Egyptian doofus in my kitchen correcting them. Don't forget guys, get woke, go broke, or as they say in Greece, wokus brokus. Now let's leave Greece and go to ancient Egypt, my home country. Ancient Egyptians used a combo before McDonald's made it sexy of opium poppy and hyoscyamus. Translation, opium poppy is opiate aka morphine and hyoscyamus is hyoscyamine. This was in the past. Nowadays, we use scopolamine and hyoscyamine as a combination for pre-medication to prepare the patient for surgery, to prepare the patient for anesthesia. We freaking told you. Let me digress for a second and ask you an existential question. Imagine that this is Adam and Adam has G6PD deficiency, the most common enzyme deficiency in the world. If Adam eats a falafel sandwich from Egypt, he can suffer an intravascular hemolysis with jaundice. But if the same Adam ate a falafel sandwich from Lebanon, he will actually enjoy it and nothing will happen. What? How is that possible? Let me tell you. The falafel in Egypt is made of fava beans. 
However, in Lebanon, it is made of hummus. And if you remember, fava beans can trigger a hemolytic attack in G6PD deficiency, but hummus does not. But hey, medicosis, I eat falafel sandwich in Australia, or New Zealand, or Scotland, or United States, or Canada. Will I be okay? Well, let's have a history lesson. The Lebanese migrated to the West and the Western Hemisphere way before the Egyptians did. So the vast, 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 vast majority of falafel in the West is made of hummus and will not trigger a hemolytic attack in G6PD deficiency cases. I mean, who else is gonna tell you about this? Harrison's internal medicine? Oh, give me a break. With all due respect to my Lebanese friends, our falafel is way better. It is just more robust. Next, the Incas. They discovered that coca plants, aka cocaine, have some analgesic effects. Analgesic. An means no. Algesa means pain. Analgesia, no pain. So the doctor will chew some coca plants in his mouth and then spit those extracts into the patient's wound to alleviate the pain of surgery. This is the exact same thing that the surgeon or the dentist does to you today using cocaine, lidocaine, perolocaine, etudocaine, pubivacaine, etc. Hashtag local anesthesia. Let me go off topic for a second. All right, if you go to the world map and you look at the equator, the equator passes through Africa and through South America. Therefore, this area is warm and this area is also warm. And as you know, the Anopheles mosquito loves warm temperature. But why did malaria devastate Africa, but there is no mention of malaria in cases of the Inca civilization? Have you ever wondered why? The answer is in one word, elevation. This area of South America has lots of mountains. As you go up, what's gonna happen? Oh, it gets colder and it's not suitable for the stinking female Anopheles mosquito to live, hence less risk of malaria. Who else is gonna tell you this? Kaplan Medical? Stop it. I learned this from my man, Dr. Thomas Sowell, by the way. So let's summarize anesthesiology. You have general, you have local, you have regional. Thank you. General is all over your body. Local, just a teeny, teeny, tiny location of your body. Regional is in between. Okay, general could be inhaled or intravenous. How about local? Usually an injection or a spray. Let's talk about regional. You have neuroaxial block and limb blocks. Oh, what do you mean by neuroaxial? Neuro, nerve. Axio. Oh, the axis. What's the axis of your body? Spinal cord, baby? Yeah, this is the epidural and the spinal anesthesia. That was in the center of your body. How about the periphery? Limb blocks. For the upper extremities, brachial plexus. For the lower extremities, lumbosacral plexus blocks. And you have some others such as IV and autonomic nervous system block for regional anesthesia. That's it in just one slide. A fun historical fact, no one, and I mean no one, used intravenous general anesthesia in the past. Why not? Because the hypodermic needle was not invented until 1855. And that's why before 1855, the only game in town when it came to general anesthesia was inhaled. No IV yet. Next, let's talk about the 18th century. Joseph Priestley, he was not actually a priest, he was a minister, you can't make that up, discovered that nitrous oxide is an anesthetic. How the flip did he make nitrous oxide? Well, he mixed some nitric oxide, which is not the same as nitrous oxide, plus some iron fillings, plus some mercury, and he got nitrous oxide. And he called it the diphlogisticated nitrous air. If you think that organic chemistry today is hard, Try saying diphlogisticated 10 times in a row. You will lose all of your friends. What the flip does diphlogisticated mean? It means it aids in combustion. It is flammable, baby. It can lead to airway fires. Next, Humphrey Davy, aka Humpty Dumpty, not to be confused with the lumpy bumpy deposits that you see in cases of acute post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. He used to add nitrous oxide gas into an airtight room. While he was in the room, he felt exhilaration and euphoria. Let's say thank you to the dentist. We have Horace Wells and Samuel Cooley, two Englishmen living in Hartford, Connecticut, United States. 
having fun, having a party. And when you have a bunch of Englishmen eating English muffin while sipping on some Earl Grey English tea and inhaling the laughing gas after joining the tea party, something was fitting to take place, and take place it did. Samuel bumped his foot so hard in the chair that he had some lacerations. And when Mr. Wells asked him, hey, did you feel pain? Well, no, I don't feel anything. Wow, maybe nitric oxide has some analgesic properties. History shall record this day. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. There is a difference between nitrous oxide, nitrogen dioxide, and nitric oxide. Nitrous oxide is N2O. This is the laughing gas. This is the anesthetic, analgesic. Nitrogen oxide is NO2. Nitric oxide is NO. The famous vasodilator. This is Viagra, baby. This is sublingual nitroglycerin. That's why you don't take them together, you freaking doofus. You will kill yourself. They will dilate your vessels so much to the point of severe hypotension. And if the hypotension doesn't kill you, the reflex tachycardia will. Coitus can kill. Horace Wells, my favorite dentist, applied the concept of nitrous oxide in the next day while performing a tooth extraction on one of his patients, and the patient felt no pain, no gain. Uh, I'm joking. 1846, diethyl ether, or simply ether, used for the excision of a neck mass, and the patient felt no pain. So, hey, Milikosis, before the discovery of the anesthetics, did they used to do surgeries without anesthesia? Oh, yeah, yeah. And the patient was feeling pain? Oh, all the time. Sometimes the doctor used to knock the patient on the head with a stick or something until they pass out. If you think doctors today are brutal, you are as naive as the B lymphocyte before it recognized the antigen. Doctors today are snowflakes. Next, the story of chloroform. Thanks to James Simpson, one of the Simpsons, and... John Snow, the same person who also prevented a cholera epidemic in Britain. Chloroform is an inhaled anesthetic. Queen Victoria tried it while delivering her baby and it felt like a charm. I mean, how was the obstetrician communicating with the queen during delivery? Was he singing to her, God save the queen? This is probably the same baby who had hemophilia. If you want to know the story about the queen's son who had hemophilia, watch my video called Hemophilia A. Actually, her son had hemophilia B, but the story is in the hemophilia A video. Uh, you get the point. 1858, the hypodermal injection started, and we started injecting morphine for treatment of painful neuralgia. Hashtag regional anesthesia. Next, it became clear that the erythroxylon coca plant will give you cocaine, and it is a local anesthetic. Then we discovered procaine, which is less toxic than cocaine. In the 20th century, we developed intubation and mechanical ventilation. If the airway is difficult, oh, we have a great device called the Ringel Mask Airway, or LMA. But in order for me to intubate and mechanically ventilate, I want to relax those muscles. That's true. Also, if I'm performing abdominal surgery, I want to relax those muscles. That's right. So it's not enough to give an anesthetic. You also need to give a muscle relaxant. Case in point, a neuromuscular blocker. And now let me take you to the 16th century, the indigenous peoples of South America. One of the Spanish conquistadores, Sir Walter Raleigh, noticed that the native people dip their arrow in some kind of liquid, and then this arrow will help them paralyze their prey. And then he said in a Spanish accent, wow, this is so cool. And then something else was discovered. Let's ask Chef Gordon Ramsay. Okay, look, big boy, hey, listen, the poison is green, oily, fluffy, aromatic. F me, even a donkey can survive the poison if artificial ventilation was provided. Wow. So let's think about that. A donkey could survive the poison if artificial ventilation was provided. What does that mean? It means that the poison causes respiratory paralysis or diaphragmatic paralysis. And the diaphragm is a skeletal muscle. So this is a skeletal muscle relaxant. This poison 
is a neuromuscular blocker. If you have watched my physiology playlist, you know that when we try to stimulate a skeletal muscle, we will have a robust cholinergic somatic fiber which releases acetylcholine onto a muscle that has an N sub M receptor. N for nicotinic, M for muscle. Once the acetylcholine binds to its receptor, the muscle is gonna contract. And it looks like this. Here is acetylcholine, exocytosis, acetylcholine is out. All right, and we have choices. It could be N sub N receptor if you're talking about a ganglion. It could be N sub M if you're talking about a skeletal muscle, which is today's topic. And it could be M, which is muscarinic, if you're talking about smooth muscle. Today, we are talking about skeletal muscles only. So the receptor is N sub M. And what's the name of that space? It's the neuromuscular junction or the motor end plate. And what does this poison do? This poison blocks this receptor. It's an antagonist on the N sub M acetylcholine receptor. And therefore, uh, hey poison, I hereby declare you a neuromuscular blocker. Okay, Medicosis, so what is that poison? Drum roll, please. That poison that you see in cartoon movies is nothing but Corari. Corari was a great discovery. It helped us treat spastic paralysis in the past. At least we tried in case of rabies and tetanus. Here is Corari, guys. See this? Tubu Corarine. It has Corari in it. Oh, it blocks the ends of M. It's a neuromuscular blocker. This beautiful slide is part of my autonomic pharmacology course available on my website medicosisperfectionalis.com. And Chibicorarine is not the only game in town, not by any stretch of the imagination. You also have Mivacurium, Atracurium, Pancuronium, Vicuronium, etc. All of them have the Corari root. In the 1930s, while everyone was terrified because of the Great Economic Depression, two heroes were hustling in the interior jungles for two years until they returned back with 25 pounds of Karari and the era of neuromuscular blockade has just begun. Why do we use Karari today? We use it during tracheal intubation. Why? To relax muscles. We also use it during abdominal surgery. Why? To relax muscles. It's a freaking neuromuscular blocker. Kurari has literally changed the world. There is the world before Kurari and there is the world after Kurari. Before Kurari, we could not give you adequate muscle relaxation for endotracheal intubation or abdominal surgery. So what we, did we do? Uh, let's say we used ether as a freaking inhaled anesthetic. We only had one choice to raise the dose a lot until you achieve some muscle relaxation. Of course, this also increased the risk of toxicity because there are no solutions in life, only trade-offs. But now we can use an inhaled anesthetic like Mr. Halothane and you add Corari to it without raising the dose of Halothane. So Halothane will knock you unconscious, Corari will relax your muscles. It's the combo. If you have learned anything from ancient Egyptians, it's that combos are key. Historically, we used ether, cyclopropane, and chloroform as inhaled general anesthetics, but we stopped. Why did we stop? Ether and cyclopropane are freaking flammable, if you remember organic chemistry. Chloroform is hepatotoxic, cardiotoxic, and causes respiratory depression. Currently, we have other options such as halothane, inflorane, isoflurane, disflurane, sevoflurane, and methoxyflurane. And we also have barbiturates. How do they work? Oh, they, uh, they bind GABA, and of course GABA is inhibitory. They will cause inactivation. They will knock you unconscious. How does GABA work? Oh, well, if you bind GABA, barbiturates will increase the duration of chloride ions. What does that mean? It means chloride will enter into the nerve. And as you know, chloride is negative. When negative ion enters, what's going to happen to the inside of the membrane? It will become more negative. And this is not depolarization. This is polarization. This is resting. This is inactivation. And this will decrease the action potential. Can you give me some examples of barbiturates used as anesthetics? Sure, thiopental and methohexital. Side effects of barbiturates include CNS depression, no kidding, respiratory depression, no kidding, and if you take it too far, coma and even death. 
Hey, Medicosis, what is the best anesthetic? There is no such thing because there are no solutions in life. There are only incremental trade-offs. Anesthesiology is the art of mastering trade-offs. Question of the day. Why do we give epinephrine with local anesthetics? Let me know the answer in the comment sections. You will find the answer key in the next video. If you like this video, you will love my autonomic pharmacology course on my website medicosisperfectionaries.com. Comes with videos, cases, notes, and a mind map. Actually, two mind maps, one for cholinergic, one for adrenergic. I also have another course for CNS pharmacology. Now, can we please, please, please take five seconds and say thank you to Dr. J in the comment section for supporting this playlist? Thank you, Dr. J, and thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website, download my autonomic pharmacology course and my CNS pharmacology course. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.